Hi again, everybody. My name is Dana, and I am the Afikra Ambassador for Montreal, and I'm going to be your host for this afternoon slash evening, uh, and you're in for a real treat. We have a presentation from Salma Sirdi on how did Hawa magazine influence Egypt's cuisine. I am really excited to introduce Salma Sirdi today. Thank you, Dana, uh, for the intro. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. I'm very excited uh, to be taking part in tonight's presentation. Uh, my name is Salma Sidi. Uh, I'm a graduate student of food studies and a researcher. Um, my interest in this particular topic for tonight has started um, quite early. Uh, I remember whenever I used to go visit my grandmother every summer as I, as I lived abroad, that's her on the right, uh, I would always watch her making all these beautiful creations in her kitchen. And she would always do so with uh, little booklets lying around in the kitchen as she cooks, what, uh, taking recipes and notes from them. And so they really piqued my interest at a very young age. Um, and later on, I would learn that these booklets came with uh, a magazine called Hawa. They were part of a magazine. And um, part of my research, I, I started to um, uh, be really interested in going around uh, old used, uh, used books markets, uh, I'm trying to look for uh, different uh, used vintage books, cookbooks, any culinary material really, and just collect them. Uh, but these specific booklets were quite hard to find. And if I was lucky, I would find an issue or two um, in a pretty bad condition. So up until last year, I only had a bunch of, uh, of uh, these uh, booklets that I, I myself inherited from my grandmother. But um, and a bunch of others that were just really in a, not a perfect condition until I found this book. So one day I found this book is a collection of over 200 um, bounded recipes, uh, booklets of these uh, of these uh, how uh, little booklets. So each booklet is almost 10 or so pages. And I found them all collected in one in perfect condition. Um, and it's signed, I found a little signature in pencil with a name, Samia Thabit. Now, I have no clue who Samia Thabit is. If someone knows any Samia Thabit in their life, please let me know. I'd love to know if, if she's the person behind collecting this gem of a book. Um, but before I dive in any deeper, um, I just wanted to give a little disclaimer. Now, my, I'm not an expert in press history, in media history in Egypt, uh, or politics, or women's studies. I'm a food researcher. Um, I'm a student of gastronomy, and part of the research process is a natural, it's an ongoing process of asking questions and getting answers and getting corrected and, and finding out more and more. So any questions at all are always welcome. Any comments, any contributions, just things that spark your interest that so you'd like to get in touch, I'd be more than happy. And of course, there's no agenda. I just really hope that you could uh, you, you, you enjoy the talk and you come to think of food as more than just food. So without any further delay, my question uh, for today is how did these booklets um, published by Hawa magazine influence cooking in Egypt? Um, many of you probably came to the presentation today um, thinking food recipes and knowing more about the cuisine and just seeing uh, more of the ingredients and the cooked recipes and whatnot. But food is always more than just food. And so I'm asking you to be a little patient as we go and delve a little deeper in the background and the politics of Egypt and, and the context of the time to understand how exactly did these booklets influence um, uh, the, the, the foods and the culinary uh, way of, uh, of the time. Uh, so as we do that, we'll also get into the magazine and who, who is the people behind it, who, are, who was the editor, the, the, the publisher, and of course, more about the reader and um, the, the yummy bits, the recipes and the content. And of course, we'll get an idea then uh, towards the end of the influence. So when we look at how Egypt was like in the mid-century, at the time, Egypt and its kitchens. So right around 1952, as many of you probably already know, there was this intense coup d'etat. 
um, a revolution that abolished uh, a long-standing monarchy, and it gave rise to um, the Arabic uh, socialist regime, which was led by Mohammed Naguib, and then later uh, more known uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Um, so the situation at the time there was a great political instability, uh, but the people who were very close to the government uh, at the time, they really thought of the government as, as the, 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 the politics was very close to the people at the time when it wasn't the case before. Uh, people did see themselves in the leadership and they did relate so much to them as the leadership themselves promised um, a better quality and better, um, uh, better cases for the public. And so the country really witnessed also, on the other hand, a very strong wave of industrialization. And that led to a lot of work opportunities in the cities. And so uh, people witnessed a big wave of immigration from uh, the countryside to the urban cities like, uh, like Cairo, as more and more work opportunities arose. And um, many of people left the, the countryside uh, and came to the cities with a very large growing middle class at the time. But what was food like at the time? Um, it was pretty similar to what we know today of uh, Egyptian, the classic Egyptian food. And this was uh, early on since the you know, early 20th century. Um, and these were the foods that were commonly enjoyed by a wide variety of people throughout the social hierarchy from the elite and all the way down. Things like food for breakfast, like fatta, variety of uh, vegetables that are cooked in stews, mainly tomato stew, uh, stew sauce, <laughs> stews, um, and uh, a wide variety of rice as well. This is a very delicious uh, uh, rice uh, that is baked, a baked rice called Ghazam Ammar, uh, baked in milk and a little bit of cream on the top. It's delicious and it's usually cooked in that pottery, um, pot, uh, pot, um, earthenware bowl. But there was also the food that was enjoyed in the Pasha's uh, palaces and that Fendiya uh, bourgeois class. And this um, bourgeois class is what we call, uh, you know, the teachers, those who brought a service to the elite. Teachers, uh, bankers, doctors, lawyers, engineers, and some business owners, of course. And their cuisine was a mix of the Egyptian that we saw before, but also very strong ties to the Ottoman inspired and uh, the Turkish inspired cuisine, some Circassian influence as well. The dish we see on the right is a sharkaseya, called sharkaseya, which is uh, rice with walnut sauce. We see the keshk that is also quite um, spread out in, in, in Turkey with different names. And even the mahshi or the dolma, the stuffed vegetables, were referred to as dolma, just like it was in Turkey at the time. Um, the aristocratic households also witnessed a very, very strong European influence. Uh, it was massive uh, on the food and on their tables. And it wasn't just the case in the 20th century, but it actually had roots since in the 19th century, as with the ruling class obsession, really, of just anything European. Um, that obsession did not start suddenly in the 20th century. It had roots all the way back in. And it was most visible during the time of Khedewi Ismail, where uh, he was not only a strong ally of Europe, but um, he actually is quoted to have said that my country is no longer in Africa. We are now part of Europe. It is therefore natural for us to abandon our former ways and to adopt a new system adapted to our social conditions. So from there, um, he was really adamant to change a lot of things in Egypt and reduce a lot of the, uh, the European cultural influence. So we see lots of changes in this infrastructure. We see lots of changes in the, in the cultural productions of the time. And of course, it was also clear on the food. And not just the food, the ways really in general, the ways in the world's view of, um, of Khedewi Ismail cascaded down throughout the years um, to his successors and the royal family. And here's an example of his uh, description of his wife um, from a Scottish newspaper. So the expert, the, ex, um, the extract I selected are a few quotes from this article as seen here. <clears throat> it says, their costumes were always brilliant and rich in the extreme, but we saw nothing purely oriental. Now, of course, there's a huge oriental influence 
almost a disappointment that there's nothing oriental per se. Um, and then we see the description of the rooms are furnished in French style with gilding and looking glasses. Um, only the beautiful Eastern carpets showed the oriental taste. Europe has come with its gaudy silks and satins and angular furniture. A few years later, we also see a description of his um, daughter-in-law, Princess Emina Ilhami, and um, that was by the London Illustrated News. And here we see a description of her appearance, saying she is like that of a European woman, dressed in the very latest Parisian fashion. She looks and behaves just like any European princess. So what happens is that when this is the elite, a lot of the majority starts looking up towards the ways of the elite. And of course, as the case with the tables and the culinary scene as well, this is a very, very strong example that just stood out to me, is the Suez Canal menu, inauguration menu in 1869, where the entire, entire menu is in French and of French food. And it also reflects um, the one of the yeah, it reflects some of the earliest cookbooks uh, of the time that were written by royal chefs um, in the early in the late 19th and early 20th century, where there's a huge French influence in the cuisine. Now, fast forward a few years later, not a few years, a hundred years later, almost from 19th century. Now, this is right after the 1952 revolution. And uh, where uh, this is a film uh, called Al Ayad Al Naima. Um, it's a it's a romantic uh, drama comedy with a touch of songs as well. Um, and the interesting scene here uh, depicts the character of a pasha, of a newly um, uh, a pasha or a royal family that was stripped of his wealth and of his dignity after the revolution. And uh, he is asked over lunch what he would like to have for lunch the next day, to which he answers. So he asked, the, the, he gets asked, what would you like to have for lunch? He said, foie gras with champignons, uh, foie gras with mushrooms. And he says it in a way where he shrugs it off and just says, that, oh, probably just foie gras with champignons. Like it's something he would have for any other day, you know? Um, now, of course, this was still uh, not the majority. It was just a, a, a layer of the, of the social classes. And it was not something that represents everyone, but it was still something that was uh, there in, in, in society. The rest of the society, however, did have access to European food, and um, especially through the wealth of, um, of restaurants and cafes and bakeries that were owned and run by uh, foreigners, Hawaga, Hawagets. Um, and these Hawagets, uh, as in the example of Gropi, uh, Gropi is a restaurant that was established by Guacomo Gropi, who was a chocolate, uh, chocolatier, a Swiss chocolatier. And uh, he came to Egypt around uh, the end of the 19th century. He, uh, he established his business, business there. And then by the 1950s, um, a common housewife from a middle class uh, could go in there for a piece of pastry with some coffee, would love the pastry and would have this uh, curiosity and wish to replicate it, but might not have the technical experience or the know-how to do to do that. But it was still uh, quite um, familiar within different uh, classes in the society, especially also made very popular in Egyptian cinema. Uh, another feature of the 1950s is that the state took very special interest in food, um, in the food industry, so it nationalized factories it provided food rations and subsidies. Um, there was a lot of factories that started creating frozen foods and canned goods and baked biscuits, uh, packed biscuits, and also chocolates and soft drinks. Another very important element um, is that since earlier in the 19th century, um, almost the 1920s and 1930s, the home economics uh, subject in schools uh, was uh, starting to spread 
and we see more and more um, girls and, and women starting to be part of this uh, education. Um, so the food taught there in these classes was a mix, a melange between the West and the East, but it was still fairly simple uh, food. So coming to our booklets back again, um, what is Hawa Magazine and what are these booklets? Uh, Hawa Magazine was a woman magazine. It was established in 1954-55 uh, by Al-Hilal Publishing House uh, under uh, Emil and Shukri Zaydan. It was nationalized by the state in a state-run campaign to nationalize major press and publishing houses in Egypt. So uh, by the 19, by mid 1950s, uh, sorry, by early uh, 60s, it was uh, it was owned completely by the state. It covered everything you can think of related to women, from fashion to beauty, uh, family advice, pregnancy, and housekeeping. And um, interestingly enough, it also featured columns on women work, uh, divorce, um, how to. Uh, create and maintain relationship at work, and even how to fix a cheating husband and deal with a mean mother-in-law. So that was really interesting. The woman behind this magazine is the editor-in-chief, Amina Saeed. Amina Saeed uh, had, was one of the leading women figures in the 20th century. Uh, she was the very first uh, editor-in-chief, and she stayed there for a while until um, until she actually headed the entire publishing group herself. She's a woman of great charisma. And this interview is with her some, sometime in the 1960s, from the 1960s. It was done by uh, the state uh, TV. And she comments about her journey in, uh, in journalism. It's just a, a short clip that I, um, I chose. ده حاجة جميلة جدا طب بعد الجامعة والتخرج وبدأت حياة الصحافة يعني متهالي ده مجال آخر صعب فيه صعاب مظبوط بس أنا ابتديت الصحافة قبل ما أتخرج كمان أنا كنت بشتغل في الصحافة وأنا طالبة في الجامعة طبعا كنت بشتغل في حاجات بسيطة صغيرة على قدي ولكن أنا كنت بشتغل فيها من قبل الصحافة وده كان شيء جديد قوي لأن الصحافة في الوقت ده ما كانش فيها ستات وما كانتش الرأي العام يتقبل وجود الست فيها قوي بالعكس كان في استنكار شديد لدرجة أن أنا اضطريت المدة الأولى أني أشتغل في الصحافة من وراء أهلي من وراء أمي أبويا كان ميت لكن أمي وأمي لما عرفت فجعت فجعة شديدة وكادت تموت كانت مريضة بالقلب وقالت لها نوبة قلبية لما اكتشفت أن أنا بشتغل في, الـ في الـ اعتبرتني بقى يعني خرجت على كل التقاليد اللي في الدنيا so this is a short clip. I uh, tried to put in a brief translation on the side for it. But it really shows that how it wasn't that usual uh, to head uh, such a role and even start out as a student in journalism. Um, now, regarding the booklets itself and the culinary booklets. So it is not exactly known when these booklets started because unfortunately, believe it or not, they're not dated. They don't have any publishing dates on any of them even those 250 booklets that I have. Um, but I ha however, I was able to reach out to some design experts who um, estimated that they were uh, published and printed out uh, sometime in the 50s uh, due to the, um, the printing methods and the colors that were used at the time. In addition to the phone numbers, the digits of the phone numbers themselves uh, suggest that by the 1950s, uh, the average phone number digits were five numbers. So we could get a sense of when they were published because of that. Uh, the books were called Hadaya Hawa, these booklets, and which literally translates to gifts from Hawa or gifts of Hawa. And uh, they were called so because they were um, uh, produced as a complementary material, bonus material, along with the main woman magazine. Um, so um, while many of them were dedicated to various topics, these are specific to just food, and these are the ones that I took a deeper look into. So it wasn't just recipes, but also they included menus uh, and also kitchen uh, tips in general. The woman behind them. So 
unfortunately, there isn't, I wasn't able to find a single photo of Bahia Osman, who is the writer, uh, recipe developer, um, culinary editor of uh, these booklets. Even though uh, she has a wealth uh, that of, of knowledge uh, that she contributed with to the field, uh, she was the last known co-author of Abla Nazira's book. Uh, so the book that we uh, refer to as Abla Nazira's book was actually co-authored by her, by Bahia Osman. So I would say she wasn't given enough credit for that book in her life. Uh, even though she started working with Hawat magazine uh, earlier than Nazira did, um, and she studied actually housekeeping in Britain on a national scholarship. She was part of uh, of the state-wide state-run uh, scholarship program in which hundreds of schoolgirls were sent out to study uh, in Britain, parts of Britain, and then come back and teach in um, in the Home Economic uh, Institute uh, around Egypt. So she partnered with Hawa Magazine uh, to edit and produce, and through her language, because of her background and education, we sense that relationship of this mentor-learner uh, uh, relationship with her audience. This is an example of one of the colleges um, in Britain uh, that hosted these uh, ladies. So this was the Barrage House. It was the first domestic science training college in Britain to appoint a lecturer with a science degree and actually have a, a state-of-the-art science lab. And what does this tell us? It tells us that that uh, culinary art at the time wasn't regarded as just an art, but it was actually considered a science that required a very uh, a complicated uh, uh, and uh, technical approach with knowledge and training. Now, regarding the reader, the reader of the magazine that was intended was the, the, the modern woman. She was a working woman. Um, she was modern, educated, and even if she wasn't working, um, she would be in the house, and uh, her priority still remained, even if she did go to work. And work at the time was limited. It wasn't like she could just go and be anything. Um, but her work, her priority still remained within the parameters of the family and the household. In fact, the woman role in, in Egypt uh, was so important and so central to the society, so much so that the state took a very particular interest using this image of, of, the mo of this modern woman who looked after her house, the mother of the little children, those who build, would later build on the nation and build the future. And this wasn't something that was unique to Egypt at the time. Uh, in many other uh, societies with socialist regimes, um, we see this role of women almost idealized so much that it, it was almost considered as an industry of its own, this industry of social reproduction um, that has, had to be celebrated. And this is an example of a song that I was able to find from a concert uh, in 1963 that celebrated the anniversary of the revolution. Um, and this is Nagat al who sang the song about the woman, the Egyptian woman. Uh, this is a rough translation of the lyrics. It's not very clear, but you get a sense of how strong this sense of nationalism and this, um, this wave of socialism and this role of the women was very central to the society and the state. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, so this was just a short verse um, that really celebrates the role of the mother and the lady of the house uh, in this nation building um, wave that was going on. And modernity was also extremely important to the state. So the woman wasn't just caught up in this modernity, but she was called to be a very active part of it. 
This is another extreme example that I was able to find. The clip shows us uh, a national campaign by the TV that employed movie stars like Sabah, uh, in this case, and Fuad al Mohandas. And they rallied against uh, the wearing of the galabiya and the ta'iyya, uh, the traditional dress of uh, Egyptian men at the time. And uh, you'll be able to see, I, I wasn't able to put a translation um, uh, for this, but you'll be able to get a sense of how the woman is convincing the husband, her husband, to uh, get rid of the old ways of dressing and to put on a modern European suit and pants. Uh, to be able to look presentable and be part of this modernity uh, for the country. So you see how really evident it was, the this, this sense that we have to be modern in how we look and, you know, leave behind the ways of the past. Um, that was the general perspective, uh, but definitely not the only one. There were those who critiqued it. However, when it comes to our own booklet, um, you guessed it, <laughs> with the modern look, uh, not a single one, uh, one time there was, wasn't ever mentioned that a scarf was, uh, was portrayed or, or a traditional dress was mentioned. The images that we saw really pretty much looked like, uh, like a nice Western uh, picnic uh, <laughs> was uh, going on. And in terms of the content itself, the, the recipes were very quick, to make most of them. Things like open-faced cheese sandwich, like bananas with coconut, uh, apples with cream, and the ingredients that were um, uh, called for were pretty easy to procure. Um, specific pamphlets were, uh, were just themed by things like eggs, so the entire booklet would just have recipes with eggs. And many local ingredients were called to uh, replace those that were uh, typically imported. Uh, and this perfectly goes in line with what was going on in, at the time with the economic policies, very strict economic policies on import bans. And on the other hand, the tools and the instructions were very simple. Simple. They were pretty much simplified as opposed to what, we, what we're seeing. The image on the right is from a 1934 cookbook by a royal chef that was published before. So we see instruments that are almost like uh, those of a surgeon. <laughs> Um, but on the other hand, the, um, the booklets really uh, called for anything that was around in the house. Uh, one specific recipe for cookies asked for um, to cool the cookies on a sieve and not uh, a, a specialized cooling rack, for example. Just things that would be lying around in the house for any resourceful housewife. Now, the content was 
um, quite interesting in the sense that most of them were international and European recipes. We see things like scones, like pudding, um, American roast, uh, chocolate trifle, Italian pie, uh, Russian salads or Russian uh, dish, uh, Spanish omelets. And um, the Italian pie actually turned out to be a pizza. So right at the end, if you notice, there's a, in Arabic, for those of you who read Arabic, it says uh, this dish is called pizza in Italian. Um, so it was interesting that in, at the time, we know that pizza wasn't probably something that was known as it is today. Um, something else that really stood out was how heavily influenced it was by British uh, cuisine at the time. And this is probably linked to the author's uh, background, Bahia Osman's background and studying in Britain. And not only Britain, but it was also, it, it, it was inspired by Imperial British cuisine as well. Things like the curry powder. Uh, some recipes uh, were named after certain locations like uh, tomatoes from Madras, like Indonesian chocolate. Uh, here we have an image of uh, Irish pancake, and then we see uh, the St. Patrick's Irish leaf, oddly, on, on one of the recipes. And one of the, uh, one of the booklets were, uh, was, was called Desserts, literally just called Desserts. And out of the 17 recipes in them, 12 out of them were for just pudding, only pudding, like in good old English pudding. So it was really striking. Uh, a little sample uh, that I had picked from the booklet contained 224 Western recipes versus just 16 that were called Eastern, quote unquote. And uh, they were things like basterma with eggs, like liver sojourn and Eastern chicken. So it was really interesting to me that, that when Eastern dishes were mentioned, they were labeled as Eastern. This is one of the pamphlets, uh, one of the booklets. Uh, it says Asbaq Shurqiyya or Eastern dishes. So this really triggers the question as if, if other booklets directly incorporated European dishes without the need to label them, what does this tell us? It was pretty much a common aspiration at the time to really interweave this Eurocentric view and, and approach it as just something that is an everyday thing without the need to label them while on the other hand, we needed to label Eastern dishes. And uh, when the Eastern dishes were, uh, were mentioned, the majority were actually of Syrian, like Syrian inspired dishes. Um, things like Fatouche, like Kubeba, like Mluchaya Shamiya, uh, Shishbarak, Labne. And um, this could pretty much be explained uh, by the, the current uh, or the, 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 the time um, of when Syria and Egypt were very close uh, in political relationship and the formation of the uh, short-lived United um, Arab Republic. And funny enough, one of, the, uh, one of these Eastern recipes was called Badanjan Azza. And it strikes me because I'm not sure. I've never came across a, a Badanjan Azza recipe before. And it's like, who is Azza? If anyone here knows who Azza is, please let me know. We could and start a hashtag for a search for Azza. Salma, just as a heads up, it's uh, 46 minutes into the thing, just so you know. Okay, I'm going to run through the next uh, few slides. Um, now, also, the home appliances mentioned was huge. So there were certain uh, sections uh, that called for uh, the use of the mixer and refrigerators and ice uh, ice making machines or ice cream machines. And this goes perfectly in line with what was going on at the time. Um, uh, Abdel Nasser here was quoted saying, the man who didn't wear wool, now wears wool, he who didn't have a refrigerator gets a refrigerator. So this was in line with the wellness uh, vision that the um, uh, country had for the, for the, the state had for the people. Uh, at the time and this need to elevate and uh, create better living standards for everyone. Um, so how did Hawa magazine influence Egyptian cooking? In a nutshell, we could say that it did empower women in its own way. Uh, it did go as far as calling them comrades, friends, uh, and it was all through a very nationalistic socialist lens. Um, the magazine did popularize the idea of culinary and uh, press writing and commercial books in a, in, in a culture that was pretty much oral. It also pioneered adapting this quick and simple quick solutions for cooking with frozen or canned uh, food 
versus this more complex um, educational approach or the elitist, uh, sophisticated high art form of the previous uh, royal chef. Um, awareness also about food's nutritional value was very important. Um, things like light food recipes and a large variety of salads was also included, uh, as well as tips. One of the um, one of the advices mentioned that um, it is cautioned against the use of salt in foods of, uh, to be accompanied in picnics because it causes extreme thirst among children. So. In addition to that, this is something I can personally vouch for, the language and the terminologies that were mentioned in these cookbooks uh, really is very present until this day among the older women. So the way things, certain things are pronounced in the case of a specific type of a sugar called the center, uh, it was mentioned in Arabic, santrafish. And I kept asking, what is santrafish? And I started to Google it in English and in Arabic and then I realized it's actually centrifuged sugar, which is um, a refining process to, to uh, clarify and, and uh, refine sugar. Uh, things like also uh, saying, um, mentioning costelita. So costelita is, uh, is, is something that was heavily mentioned uh, in uh, some meat recipes. And after going back and checking, it comes from costoleste in Italian. If, and if you are Italian, um, uh, speakers, uh, it refers to the cutlet of a rib, like a rib cutlet of beef. Uh, things of that sort, and also using certain ingredients like curry, which wasn't common uh, at the time, started to become more, uh, more popular. And finally, this accessible and easy knowledge about um, European food and inspiration, when it was something at a previous era, something that was exclusive to just the elite and those who um, uh, were part of the, uh, of the royal uh, class. So why not feature Egyptian food? Like, like I said, I mean, some, some, some of the reasons could be attributed to the state's policies of this being modern, um, but also to just the simple oral culture of the time, the way recipes get transmitted from one uh, grandmother to her daughter to her granddaughter is really through this, um, oral uh, tradition and not not necessarily uh, a written form. So maybe they just simply didn't feel a need to um, write about or publish and share knowledge about something that they think women already know about. They probably thought women already know about Egyptian food. So why, why is there a need to do that? And finally, there were also considerations about what is deemed healthy or not healthy. Now, fast forward to the day, the result is that um, we see a lot of European food. And of course, uh, Hawa uh, magazine and the booklets were only one uh, reason. There's a lot of other factors that, that come to play with uh, the modernization and the, this European influence uh, in the Egyptian cuisine. Uh, one recipe from the booklets is a little gift from me before we part, uh, I'm leaving you with the layered tongue sandwich for those who dare to make it. Just joking. I actually picked um, my own grandmother's uh, recipe that I remember she used to make uh, from a chocolate uh, booklet. And it's of chocolate biscuits. If you would be interested, to maybe perhaps take a screenshot, recreate it yourself, uh, share the results with me and Africa. It'll be lovely to know how it turns out. Um, and finally, this is a uh, the readings, some of the readings, uh, further readings and resources, bibliography that I used. It needs probably uh, some telescopic uh, skills. Um, so I'll be happy to share you, with you um, any questions that you have, any specific sources that you're interested to read more about, uh, videos, uh, please just let me know. This is my uh, contact information. And um, I'm happy to uh, go into the question and answers or any discussions that you might have. Salma, that was awesome. We have three questions I wanna squeeze in very quickly. I should say that this, um, this presentation will go on our website, including the references. So you won't need a microscope to read them. Uh, Tony, I'm asking you to unmute for your first question. Sure, uh, Salma, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I guess my one was, it was one of a uh, common. I was surprised to see that Melukhiye was categorized as like Melukhiye Shamiye. 
but I did have a question about while you're looking at these books that uh, sort of highlight modernization to mimic a European influence, did you see, did you come across any Egyptian authors that were sort of trying to resist those changes and sort of lean into uh, more traditional uh, food practices at the time? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the, the question. <laughs> I mean, as I said, I ended with why not feature Egyptian uh, cooking. Um, in Hawa booklets, um, there wasn't. I mean, it was only one contributor uh, for this time period. Uh, Nazira Nicola did come on board uh, towards the end of the period, late 60s, 70s, and she did include a lot more. Uh, but unfortunately, in the booklets, there wasn't much Eastern uh, or Egyptian yeah, I mean, influence. Most of them, like I said, was just purely, you know, European and very little fusion too. Like you would imagine that maybe there was a sense of, uh, of uh, a room to play with things and maybe perhaps create things that are a fusion of both worlds, but there wasn't. So it seemed to be very structured uh, in the way it was approached. Um, but in general, there were some other authors, most of them though, or until the 1950s, uh, it was through textbooks, uh, those domestic science uh, textbooks, and many of them did include uh, a lot more Egyptian food uh, than we see here uh, in, in the booklet. Okay, great. Um, Moza? Um, Alan Selma, again. Um, can you Hi, hear me? Hi, Moza. <laughs> yes. Um, so I was just wondering, because I, I knew that a lot of uh, women ended up going to the UK to do like their home economics courses, uh, but I guess I just never found out if there was like a specific uh, scholarship or a program that pushed women to do that, or was it just self-funded because they all could afford it? I mean, the specific class that this was catered to, I'm assuming was able to to do that, but just wondering about any kinds of programs that, you know, could have supported. Yes, so um, through reading some of the introdu introductory texts and a lot of the uh, textbooks, uh, school uh, textbooks, I was able to find many references to uh, uh, things like I won a scholarship or I was part, I was sent abroad on as part of a scholarship with other uh, women. So there is definitely references to that, um, as well as some other writings I could share with you also uh, that uh, cover uh, this bit. And the last question comes from Annie. And then while I do that, I think Dan is going to share a screen uh, for our uh, feedback form, just to remind Annie. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It was incredible. I, I really love all the film clips and the songs um, that added a lot. And my question is about this breakdown of all these European recipes um, that you identified in these uh, uh, booklets. And I was wondering if you noticed any trends in that category, like were there less French and more British, or you mentioned a couple of Italian recipes that, that, entered in. So I was just curious, like within the, the European recipes you identified, what trends there might have been in this specific genre? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I would say that there was, in, in pastries and desserts, the French cuisine ruled, <laughs> uh, there was a lot of references to things like uh, strawberry charlotte or eclairs and pc fours and uh, baton salé and things that were even um, uh, not necessarily termed as, uh, for example, the baton salé. They're basically salted uh, breadsticks, and um, they're they so they were called baton salé. While in uh, looking for baton salé in French cookbooks, they were not called per se baton salé, but they did use uh, in our booklets in Arabic uh, those French names, uh, French words, and terminologies. Um, and then, of course, the other half of the desserts were puddings, uh, and they were literally called, like, referred to puddings. While we, in, in Arabic, there is uh, plenty of other words, like uh, almazeya at the time, or, um, or things like, um, I'm sorry, I, I can't remember the word exactly, another, another term, um, like mahalabiya, for instance. That would that would constitute a similar idea of a pudding, but the word pudding is, uh, instead was used, and things like um, 
like the English trifle, for example. And when it comes to uh, the rest of the um, uh, savory uh, items, for example, I would say it was it was this general modern European um, stores, things that you'd find like uh, a, a picante, a chicken picante, or um, a, a, you know, a grilled ribs with a certain glaze. Um, I wasn't able to find exactly where, you know, these recipes were un unless they were called specifically from where they, uh, they, were, they came from. Things like Spanish omelette, for instance. Um, but, I mean, most of them were of French influence, French and British influence, more than anything else. Great. Um, You're that's awesome. Um, Dana, do you want to wrap it up? Yes. Thank you, Salma. That was very fascinating. Would Uma Ali be considered a pudding, just out of curiosity? Is I wouldn't. I mean, it's a it is a bread bread pudding. It's not broken down per se mm -hmm. and cooked in that sense of baked. But I mean, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, if you love today's event, Mikey is going to share the link in the chat to our feedback form. It's really important to get feedback so we know how we're doing. So please do that. It takes thirty seconds. And again, if you'd like to support us uh, and love what we're doing, keep us going, keep us growing, keep this thing sustainable. This is a community powered event. So please be one of the people who supports us. And thank you so much to those on the call who are supporters. And with that, have a nice day. We will hopefully see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you again, Salma, for a very, very great presentation. Thank you, Dana. It was my pleasure. And thank you, everyone, for attending and Mikey for arranging. Yeah. And thanks to Dana for hosting. <laughs> <laughs>